When I was a kid, I grew up in a very rural part of Tennessee, and my grandparents owned a farm surrounded by 20 acres of land that they also owned. Now on all three sides were other properties owned by other people, all of which we knew well, and the north end of the property backed up onto a road with fencing to separate it. The owners to the right and across from us were nice, and we never had any problems. But Duke lived to our left, and his property, a pig farm, was connected to ours, where we had our farmhouse, and it was only separated by a barbed wire fence. He wasn't exactly a good farmer, and his pigs often escaped, and would terrorize us, our animals, and destroy our gardens. It got so bad that eventually my grandfather told him that if we caught pigs on our property, we would shoot them. This was allowed by the local police as hogs, especially ones allowed to roam, are a hazard and nuisance, and if gone on long enough cause serious dangers and damage, and he had already had various warnings from police and animal control. Soon after, it got so bad that my grandfather began having me keep watch some nights to keep an eye out for them. We had several deer stands throughout our property, and if we noticed signs of pigs, we would stake out the area that night. One part of our property had a very old cemetery in it. I'm talking late 1700s to early mid 1800s. There's no official record of this cemetery, and most of the grave markers are rocks, some with crudely carved dates and some without. And this being the South, we believed it to be an old slave cemetery, but we do not know if that's actually what it is. One morning, we came across signs of pigs in and near this old cemetery, and we had a deer stand about 50 yards up the hill and I was given the task of sitting up there that night to watch for pigs coming and going. So I went home, prepped my things, and headed back to the stand as dusk rolled around. I sat there for hours. I never saw a pig, a deer, or even a squirrel. There was no wind, no movement, or the usual forest sounds. Just complete silence. Anyone who grew up in nature or rural areas knows this is far beyond normal, and the superstitious ones know to hightail it out and not look back. Around 2 a.m., I was barely keeping my eyes open. The only thing keeping me from falling asleep was the fear of the unnatural quiet surrounding me and the fear that I would topple from the stand to the ground. Suddenly, I heard a long sighing sound, as if someone walked in on a mess and let out a breath of frustration. I bolted upright, looking around for any signs of what it could have been. The only place I couldn't see was directly below the stand, unless I dared move to lean completely over the edge. As I was attempting to do this, I heard a shuffling noise as if someone were dragging themselves through the brush. When I looked to my left, I saw a shadowed figure along the tree line. I could barely make out that it was even there because it was so dark. There was no moon or stars, only clouds and the shadows of the trees. As I watched, I almost convinced myself I was seeing things until the figure lurched out of the tree line and across the clearing. It appeared to be the size of an average man, but it was hunched, almost painfully so, and its arms nearly drug on the ground. Imagine if a normal man was starving and unable to stand straight, as if it carried a heavy load on his back and had had every bone in his arms and shoulders dislocated. This is what it reminded me of. I didn't notice clothing or any sort of covering on its body. It wasn't large, like muscular, 
it was actually quite scrawny and seemed to have trouble moving. As I watched, it entered the cemetery, of which the borders were only marked with large upright stones in each of the corners. It stopped for a moment and turned in my general direction, and at first I thought I'd been spotted, but it turned back and slowly began to walk among the rows of stones. Sometimes it would stop and stare at a particular stone before moving on, and once I saw it run its fingers along a patch of earth. It reached a marker in a random spot of the cemetery, and it seemed to collapse, as if it just folded in on itself like a house of cards. I could still make out the lump, but had I not seen it do this, I would have assumed it was a shadow or a mound of dirt. After this, I woke up in the tree stand, and it was a little bit after dawn. There was no evidence of anything happening that night. No tracks, no indents, no nothing. I told my grandfather what I saw, and he said that I was dreaming. I made several trips back to the cemetery in the following months, always during the day. And for the first time, I felt an incredible sadness being there. Before, it had just been surreal, terrible, that these people had died, but I had never felt so saddened by it. Once, I left some wildflowers on the markers and the patch of earth the creature had touched, just to see what would happen. I came back the next day to find them all piled on the spot that the creature had collapsed onto. After this, the few times I lingered in the woods too long after sundown, I would get an eerie feeling. Not exactly like I was in danger, but the feeling of being watched, as if something was waiting for me to leave. This goes back a few years when I was in college. The school was a seminary college, hosted by a Benedictine monastery, surrounded by a couple of hundred acres of woods. There were only three dorm buildings and 130 students. About a hundred yards from the building I was staying at that year was a retreat center, and about another hundred yards down the road there was a cemetery where the monks would bury their dead. During my sophomore year, my dorm somehow caught on fire. It was the second or third week of October. I remember waking up around four in the morning, to the fire alarm going off. We all walked out in our pajamas, walking fast down the stairs to the reunion point. The night was cold and it was almost surreal seeing everybody with a surprised look as we saw the fire coming from the roof. This was the first time I had ever been in a fire, and it was not like those movies in which the whole building is consumed by flames and people are rushing through smoke-filled hallways. There was none of that. Everything was so calm that we even thought it was a fire drill, until we walked outside and saw that the building was actually on fire. The fire department showed up, and after the fire was put out, the people from the other two dorms were instructed to go back to their rooms to sleep. The fire department said it was safe to go back in to get anything we might need, so we were allowed to go to our rooms to get all our belongings. Apparently, it was only the server room that had caught on fire, and since that small room was a bit isolated from the main hallway, there was no damage done by the fire to any of our rooms. Still, we weren't allowed to go back to live in the dorm until much later on. Meanwhile, we were displaced to the retreat center. There was about 30 of us. It wasn't too bad. We had much larger rooms and a private bathroom. We had a community bathroom back in the dorm. A whole week went by, and we adapted fairly quickly. The whole experience was actually good for all of us since we began socializing more with each other. 
all of us now had something in common we could talk about, namely our experience with the fire, and the more isolated feeling we had at the retreat center united us. Of course, being all guys, and Halloween coming up in less than a week, a wave of pranking came upon us. People were scaring each other at night, standing by their windows with scary masks on, using fishing lines to move the blinds in someone's room at night, etc. It was funny and harmless. I didn't believe in ghosts anyway. Not until the night before Halloween. I went to bed early that night. I was tired from a long day of study, and after working out, I headed straight to my room to shower and then went to bed. I watched some videos on YouTube and fell asleep. About five in the morning I woke up. That's when I saw it. A tall, black figure standing by my bed. There was no face. Just a solid silhouette standing next to me. It was staring at me. I knew it. I felt scared like I've never been before. I tried to scream, but I couldn't move a muscle. It was there, just standing. I was afraid. It was a deep fear. I felt like something really horrible was going to happen. And then, I just fell back to sleep. I woke up to my alarm clock at 6.30. That was the last I thought about the dark figure. I assumed it was just a case of sleep paralysis, or perhaps just a nightmare, so I brushed it off. That was until I heard other guys talking about the same thing happening to them. At first, it was only one freshman. Maybe someone was pranking us. But then another, and another. It was about ten guys, all at the same time on the same night. Halloween came and went. None of us had that experience again. We moved back into the dorm about a month after the fire. I completely forgot about the incident, until many years later. I left seminary formation after graduation, and went back to my hometown. One night, I was at my friend Jake's house. It had been about four years since the Halloween incident at the retreat center. We were sitting around a cooler having some beers in the front yard. We were talking about football and then somehow we ended up talking about creepy shit that had happened in our lives. I remembered the incident at the retreat center all of those years back. We all laughed about it and concluded it was probably the seniors pranking us. After all, I was the only sophomore who saw the dark figure that night. It could have been anything. They continued with their stories and I went to the backyard to take a piss. I went all the way down to a line of bushes that divided Jake's house from his neighbors. There's a tall fence in between the bushes and the other house, so I found some privacy there. And I saw it again. My body froze. Something had caught my attention to the left, on the opposite corner of the backyard. I saw the dark shadow just standing there, looking at me. I rushed back to the front yard and didn't say a word. It was, again, the second or third week of October. I continued seeing it every now and then, always at night, always far from me. Last Halloween, things changed a bit. I woke up again in the middle of the night. I felt so cold, I thought I had left a window open. But when I opened my eyes, I saw its face for the first time. It was grabbing my arm, and it felt so cold. A pair of emerald green eyes were staring at me. Its face so close to mine, and I couldn't scream. I couldn't move. My body was freezing, as if I had just jumped into a river on a cold December night. It was hard to breathe. It drew its face closer to mine. Those eyes that wouldn't blink. 
That skinny, decrepit face. I'll never forget those things. I could feel it breathing, and I felt so much fear. It wasn't that fear that one feels when threatened. It wasn't a fight-or-flight response. It was a deep, unexplainable, paranoid feeling. I felt completely hopeless, as if all hope and goodness had been driven away from my life, and all that was left for me to feel was abandonment and despair. The face turned the world into a hopeless and meaningless void in which I was thrown into. Then I heard a deep, guttural voice coming from its mouth. Beware, it said. Beware. And then it was gone, leaving behind only the rancid smell of its breath. I don't know how, but I fell back to sleep right away. Last night I saw it again. I woke up suddenly. The same deep, guttural voice screamed inside my head. Wake up, it said. I woke up, and the same feeling invaded every inch of my body. Beware, it kept saying over and over. It was a desperate voice now, a terrifying scream. It was grabbing my shoulders, and suddenly it just disappeared, and I felt like I had just woken up. I cried. I couldn't keep that to myself anymore. I spoke to Father Robert back from my years in the seminary. He was the retreat center chaplain. After I explained the story to him, he was silent for what felt like an eternity. Come see me as soon as you can, he said. Before hanging up, he just said, pray. I will be heading there in the morning. I couldn't keep this to myself anymore. Two weeks ago, my sister and I got back from playing Pokemon Go in a cemetery. We went with a group of family and friends, but nothing crazy happened. After dropping them off, we went home. When we reached our house, we opened the car doors. We heard a growl in the bushes from across the street at our neighbors. The only way I can describe the growl was that it was loud, guttural, and almost demonic. I was raised out in the country as a young child, so I have never heard anything like it. I also have been in a few life and death situations, and the way I felt after hearing it, I immediately became fearful. Dread rose up inside me as I told my sister quietly to get inside the house. I didn't take my eyes off the bush the entire time. I backed up into the house and shut the door. A few things happened that night. We heard two loud crashes, once at about 4 a.m. and the other at about 6 a.m. I searched the house and found no explanation of these sounds. It was loud enough that my dad and sister both woke up each time it happened. Fast forward to tonight. My dad, sister, and I were here at the house. My sister was falling asleep because she's been working out at the gym in the early hours due to her job. My dad was in his room watching TV. I was in the living room talking to an ex on Facebook Messenger when my dog went crazy. He usually doesn't bark unless someone knocks on the door, but he was going nuts. Hair raised, bare teeth, and barking at the window. I figured someone was outside creeping around, so I grabbed a knife and put my dog in the garage for a second. Had I opened the front door, he probably would have ran outside. I opened the door and went outside into the night. I didn't see anything. After a few minutes of watching and waiting, I went over to the side of the driveway where our boat sits to smoke a cigarette. I was sitting there when I heard pattering sounds, like an animal running around on the concrete. Then my dog started going crazy in the garage. I got up and followed the sounds around to the other side of the boat. When I reached the other side, I saw a massive black dog. 
I've owned Rottweilers and had a neighbor who owned a bull mastiff, but this thing was bigger than either of those. Its head was about the size of my chest, and the top of it would probably reach my belly button. I'm 5'11". There was no real light outside, but for some reason its eyes were glowing. When I noticed that, I stopped moving. Even though I saw its glowing eyes, I couldn't tell if it had actually seen me or was even looking at me. That's when it started growling, in the same tone my sister and I heard a week ago. The only thing going through my mind was to slowly back off and get back into the house. I started moving backwards, and the black dog slowly crept toward me. I've never been scared of dogs, but this was frightening to realize it was stalking me. I remember thinking, I'm going to have to kill this dog somehow, otherwise it's going to kill me. I made it to the porch and opened my door. By this time, the huge black dog was under my porch light, and I could see it better from about five feet away. I've never seen a breed like it. It was massive and mean. It wanted to kill me, but it was taking its time. I shut the door and went to my living room window to watch it, but by then it was gone. Could it have been some type of omen or spirit I might have bothered at the cemetery? The cemetery sits back behind the railroad tracks, next to the 57 freeway. You would miss it if you did not know what you were looking for. It looks locked up. I gotta be honest, I never really let a locked gate deter me. After all, there is no sign that says do not trespass. You can see there are three large locks on the gate. The road goes down and across a train track, and down a bit further to the cemetery. To the right is the freeway. I call my friend Mary. I tell her about the locked gates, and ask if she knows another way in. She always knows another way in. Under the freeway pass, further to the right, is a fire road and gate. Not an actual gate, like a swinging pole. I walk over there. No signs to keep out. The fire road is really a road over an aqueduct, and then a huge dirt field. I slip under the pole and walk on, Cammy following behind me. I am still on the phone with Mary. I'm reasoning with her on why I am not trespassing, and she is agreeing. I get to the underpass and I smell weed. I round the corner and there is a guy. Smallish, with glasses, painting with spray paint. I say, hey. I continue talking to Mary and tell her that if I should get arrested, please bail me out. I cross the tracks and can hear Cammy talking to the graffiti guy. I continue down, and the cemetery is indeed open. I look up about fifty feet in, and there is a no trespassing sign as the grounds are for tenants' use only. I chuckle and choose to act as if I do not see it, and prepare to act dumb if I'm caught. What tenants exactly, anyways? I take pictures. I catch nothing of great intrigue, and decide to turn on my phone recorder, and place it at the base of the tombstones, I see and hear no one, so I feel confident with my phone there while I scoot around the place. So Cammy and I walk around. I keep hearing movement around me. I catch a shadow or two in the corner of my eye. I blow it off as the wind, with the hope that if it is someone, they will speak to my phone, and I will catch the audio. Cammy walks up to me and says, I hear keys shaking at me, like right behind me. I never comment on an investigation, as I do not feed into hysteria or mind tricks. I decide to walk over to my phone 
and take a last spin around using the Ghost Box app. I look up and there is a gentleman at the fence wearing all white. I stop and look at him. He does not move. At first I squint to see if he might be peeing. Maybe he does not see us or does not care. Nope, not peeing, just standing and staring. I cannot make out any features on him other than he's tall and wearing white. He walks towards the steep hill. I look at Cammy and say, we should probably go ahead and go. I do not like the human visitor. She says okay. I grab my phone and turn off the recorder and see if I have messages. One from Mary. She had decided it was important for her to drive down. I look up to see if I see the man and the side of the mountain catches my eye. There is a black line of what I think could be people in black moving quickly and like a snake down the mountain. I cannot see any features nor faces. I can see heads. I can see shoulders. I can see arms. I can see legs. But I see no separation between their torsos. I chuckle to myself. My mind goes to a warped movie where humans are sewn together. Fucking human centipede, right? However, something about the movement and the quickness unsettles me. You know when someone runs down a steep hill, you can see them do so in jumps and jerky movements? They did not and they moved in sync. Like they were just one. Impossible but unsettling all the same. I tell Cammy, go, just go. We get to the exit and look toward the hill. The man in white is sitting on a rock at the base. I still cannot see any features. The black line of people or whatever is already there. It moved ridiculously fast, impossibly fast. Cammy and I head out towards the tracks to the tunnel. The black line is behind us, moving in a straight line. We go through the tunnel. Cammy is way ahead of me as I keep slowing down to look behind me and try to grasp a feature, any feature, an eye, a mouth, a nose, something. There is nothing, and I'm wondering if they are wearing masks. I come into the tunnel and the graffiti guy startles me with a, have fun? I feel like I can take a breath. Then we hear rocks being stepped on in the tunnel. I yell to Cammy to move. She is already out of the tunnel and in the dirt field. The graffiti guy looks at me like, who the hell? I said, there's a group of people behind me and I do not know what's up with them. I take off towards the end of the tunnel to leave. I get outside and I see Cammy up ahead, almost out of the field and to the car. I keep looking behind me. No one exits the tunnel. I am halfway through the field now. I look forward at Cammy and smile because I'm home free and feel stupid for being scared. I see her eyes widen. I turn around. The line of black things is right up behind me. I mean right up behind me. I can still see no features. I grab my phone and call Mary. I want someone to know where I am when I am killed. I look and they are far behind. I look towards Cammy and back again and they were up on me again. I got to the water crossing and slipped through the pole. I looked back and they, or it, was in the middle of the field, still facing me and walking towards me. I got in the car. They never did leave the dirt field. Hey guys and ladies, thanks for watching. If you want me to tell your story, email me at the address in the description. We're about to get some food here. Oh, thank you. You go for the ride? We're at the drive-thru. Uh, hey, you ready?
Good morning. Good morning. It's three in the afternoon, isn't it? Yeah. All right. How are you doing today? I need a vacation. You need a vacation? Yeah. Who are you? I'm nobody. Just some regular dude. I've seen you before. You're the asshole on TV. I'm not on TV. I tell scary stories on YouTube, though. Come on. Don't bullshit me. No, I'm serious. Thanks for the tip. Okay, do you guys have those frozen chocolate drinks? I can't remember what they're called. Frosty! Yeah, Frosty. Yeah. Alright, I'll have a medium one of those. No deal. Why? I lied. You lied about what, having Frosties? Yeah. Well, that's not funny, man. What are you, my father? No, but there's fucking people waiting behind me. Stop whining! I'm not whining. Stop it! Okay, you know what? Can I have a number four? Large with cherry coke and no pickles. Yeah. And that's it. Go ahead. You hear this asshole, Ripley? He's probably gonna spit in our fucking food. Oh shit. I got bad news, man. What's the matter? I forgot my wallet. You son of a bitch! Be good to animals, even people. Oh, you like that? See ya. Yo, Snemark, Barracksmas, Hirsch. Uh, hey, you ready? Not you. Not you, poops, I'm sorry. <laughs> good morning. It's three in the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs>